Now this was my Insta360 1R. Now it's been through some pretty major updates and I've given it fairly thorough testing. What do I really think of it? Now let's be clear from the outset that the damage to this camera is no fault of Insta360s. Uh, the person who caused this put it on Facebook and people said, oh, lithium batteries, oh, that's bad. Nope. This is what happens when you lend your camera to somebody who stuffs it into a tail pack, sticks that on the back of a KTM directly behind the exhaust. Then the bag mounts, the camera mounts, then it falls out of the bag and bounces down the road. But it still works. Well, you should consider any 360 camera to be a piece of precision equipment. You know, there's no escaping the fact that you have to have two lenses sticking out of it, you know, one on either side. It's precision equipment, not a delicate piece of equipment. It's great that Insta360 does actually offer a service to be able to polish these lenses if they do get a bit scratched. And of course, if they do get badly damaged, you can just replace the 360 module. But all in all, having dragged this at high speed through bushes, smacked it into a fence post, ridden for an hour through torrential rain, and finally seeing it killed off by somebody with suboptimal packing skills, I'd say it really is as tough as you can expect any 360 camera to be. Like the majority of reviewers on YouTube, I was sent this camera by Insta360 to review. Uh, I was given the opportunity of an affiliate link, which you see a lot of people do, and that's fine, you know, the, it gives people a bit of a kickback, gives them some money back on uh, any product sold using their link, but, you know, maybe I'm in a lucky position with my job, um, but I don't think it's healthy gaining any kind of revenue from something you're discussing in a review. Maybe I'm just a bit old fashioned. Anyway, this is my new Insta 361R, which I bought from Amazon. Luckily, there was a sale on while I was doing it. I got 10% off through the Insta 360 store. By the time this comes out, that sale will finish, but do, you know, do check out the Insta 360 store. So I guess you can kind of stop watching this video now because you know that I rate this highly enough that I will buy one. But this video is about telling you why I use this, why it changes the way I work so dramatically, but also the things you really need to know just in case you're thinking about buying one, the things you need to know that might make it not right for you. If you're not already aware, the Insta360 is of course a modular camera. That means that the battery comes off and you can separate the camera module and put on a different one. So I've just got the twin pack, uh, which comes with a 4K single lens camera, like a GoPro, and the 360 mod, as they're called by Insta360. It's a really good system. I was worried that it was gonna be uh, a bit fragile, flimsy, but you know, it really hasn't proved to be. So I've already done a review of this uh, camera and it was, you know, I was very impressed with it. It did get me, help me get some really good angles. But since making that, I've updated this to the new software version 1.1.43. So let's go through and talk about each section of, first of all, what makes this good. First of all, versatility. I can't stress enough how much of a difference this camera makes to the way I film. I can literally just put it on the bike, either sticking it on with a GoPro mount or by attaching it on the end of a selfie stick. And it, I just think roughly where I wanna be able to look and that's it. I can compose the shots later in the edit and it it's really, really has changed the way I film and it's really made the last few videos I've produced so much easier to film on my own uh, and with other people with me there riding, but it's just so much quicker and easier. Filming with this camera, you can get multiple angles from one pass. That means you can be riding with the camera fitted and then in edit, so for instance, on the recent Royal Enfield versus Moto Guzzi versus Triumph video, I was able to do one pass down the motorway, get footage of me riding the bike, get footage of one of my mates riding their bike, then the other mate riding their bike, the three of us together. With one pass, I was able to get all those angles just editing them afterwards. Really speeds things up significantly. When I were a lad, back working in magazines, late nineties, doing tracking shots used to mean following a car literally about a foot behind it. Uh, the photographer would be hanging out the back of the car uh, and you, you'd have to ride right behind it. You often couldn't see what was happening on the road ahead. So you had to totally trust the driver in front of you. And obviously you wanted it to look dynamic. So we were having to do cornering stuff and you'd have to know that the driver wouldn't slow down. Obviously we'd 
always try to have spotters out there to check that the road was clear and everything. Um, nowadays, we often do still film riding right behind the cone front, but we only do it at launches. That's overseas. That doesn't mean it's fine because it's abroad, but it's overseas and they've shut the roads down. Uh, the manufacturers have to pay to get permissions to shut sections of road, uh, and then we follow specially built tracking cars. Typically, you know, it might be a, uh, a Land Rover Discovery. And they've got a platform on the back and the photographers there on track is easier, obviously, but on the road you're following them and you still can't see past it. For, for, for the kind of shooting I'm doing, this is great because I can just put it on the back of the bike or on, the, on an arm, on the selfie stick on the back of the bike and then not worry about where it's pointing, not worry about my position or where the camera's looking because it can be fixed in post. And it means that the rider behind is safer as well because they're not having to be right on the tail of the bike or anything like that. They've got plenty of space to move. So it's just a safer way of riding. It's more, it's a natural way of riding. Now, at any time, this goes without saying, at any time you're filming anything and any time you're riding, but any time you're filming anything, you should risk assess the situation and only focus on your riding. Don't be distracted by the fact that you're trying to film something. The, the filming should be of the natural things that are happening. So do be careful, but this has changed the way it's, allowed us to get footage safely that we couldn't have done before without shutting roads or and without having other people on a crew to do it. The cost saving is something that's important really to me and to, to us uh, because while I tend to film and edit most of my videos myself, you, you can probably tell, uh, there is footage we need where we get other people involved uh, and typically for tracking stuff you know you are going to need to to pay the videographer to be there and you're going to need another person there to be driving and if you've got two riders that means you still need a third person to drive uh, so it adds up so you know th this has actually paid for itself in pretty well one shoot uh, so depending on what you do it's worth bearing in mind pro videographers you know you go oh 5.7k is oh that's good but it's that's everything by the time you've cropped it down you know you're getting very good youtube footage uh, broadcast footage hmm. but bear in mind you know i always think a friend of mine's a um, BBC World Surface videographer. They only shoot 1080. Uh, so, you know, you can get footage out of this that is very good, but there are limitations. The stabilization, because this thing, of course, is looking at everything in a massive 360 degree view, the stabilization is able to be outstanding. Even with this bouncing on the end of a selfie stick, it can get bouncy. And sometimes there's some footage you think, nah, it doesn't really work. The way there's only so much you can do of stabilizing the bike and the background. It kind of has to choose what it's going to try and keep steady. And sometimes things get a little bit too shaky and you think, mm, I don't really like that shot. But so much footage comes out, you just think, wow, that's awesome. Despite the battery costing $29.99 for a, an extra one, which isn't bad, you can also get a fast charging hub that will charge up to two at a time. I haven't felt the need for an extra battery. Uh, I can film everything I need from a day shoot, so that's a day out riding. Now that's not to say it's running all day by any stretch. I turn it off between shots, um, but an hour of footage is more than enough for a, 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 a typical half hour feature. Because it takes more time to edit and I don't want to be wading through stuff. But also because it's so easy to get the shots and not be faffing around thinking, did I get that angle right? Do I need to do another pass? Do I, now do I need to do it to get a second angle? You get multiple angles in one go. I can pretty much shoot all I want in one go. But if you do need another battery, 29.99, not bad. The update has optimized the battery life apparently. Apparently it's made it not quite run as hot. I didn't notice a problem with overheating, but I did get 67 minutes and 31 seconds of continuous recording out of this. That's nine minutes more than before the update. So negligible, but like I say, it's more than enough for me. Now I couldn't say this before this update, but the Insta 361R audio is pretty good. It's not excellent. Uh, I'd say the GoPro is very good. Uh, for vlogging, the kind of stuff you're gonna be doing with this where you're just chatting to the camera after you've you know, got some shots of you riding or something like that while you're walking around on holiday or anything like that, it's good. Um, but it just doesn't have that edge of the GoPro still. It was terrible. <laughs> Uh, it used processing to try and enhance the vocal uh, range 
and it did it really badly. Um, and when it, when you were riding with it, it made horrible noises, like just like a GoPro, it catches the wind. Uh, and when you're riding into the wind, you're not gonna get that much. You just hear the wind noise. Shoot in the INSV format, that's effectively a raw format. Even if you're using the 4K module or the 360 module, it allows you to change the uh, noise reduction settings in the edit. If you shoot in MP4 format on the 4K module, which is like using a standard single lens GoPro, uh, those settings are baked in. So even with the 4K mod on it, I'd suggest shooting in the INSV so you can adapt it because you also get the better stabilization with the INSV file. You don't get it with the MP4 format in the 4K module. There's also a microphone adapter for this. It's, it's really small. It's a lot smaller than GoPro's version. So it sticks out the side of the camera. Then you've got the uh, microphone adapter sticking out the side of that. It sticks out way too far. And I had it on the side of my helmet and I kept bashing it on things. I bashed it on the gate post and the door frame. And I'm really surprised it didn't snap it off. You can do it. And maybe you'll find another way of setting up that you think it works for you. It's a, it's a better adapter than the GoPro one because it's so much smaller, but I haven't used the GoPro one. As far as I understand, that does work well. The good thing with the GoPro one is you can tuck it out of the way. But here, you know, you are losing your waterproofing. It just doesn't work that well. Honestly, the best system I've ever used for on-bike talking has been the Senna 10C Pro with a uh, intercom, with a camera built in, the microphone in. It's really good, really good audio and everything. And it works great. The audio from this is great. I was using a Rode Lovelier mic, which is about 70 quid. It's the one that comes with the film. Well, it's this one and I had the dead cat on it, and it was, it was really good audio, but it's, it's not for me. To be honest, that doesn't bother me because I don't like to shoot uh, footage of me talking while I'm riding. I find it distracts me. If I'm pushing on, I find it too distracting trying to think about what I'm gonna say, and I prefer to kind of get back and just say, because I come from years of writing up a feature and thinking about what I'm trying to say in it, it works better for me to be able to think about it afterwards and then do a commentary later on. Have a look, see what you think in this footage. Well, have a listen, see what you think in this footage, because mistakenly, to get to the settings to change the uh, field of view in the 4K mod, so whether you're gonna go for super wide, wide linear, uh, it's useful, but you want those settings, but they're quite fiddly to get to. And by the time you've got to them, they're right next to the button to put it into manual exposure, which I accidentally pressed and then left me with this bleached out footage. I probably should have gone out and reshot it, but honestly, I left it in here because I wanted you to see the things that do annoy me about this camera, the things that I think aren't quite right about it. Certainly compared to a GoPro where the settings are very intuitive and the ones you need quickly are there, it's easy to use the um, display, it's a big difference. I'll uh, show you this footage with both the um, noise reduction on and off so you can really get an idea of how it works. So if we do a steady 60 miles an hour now, and you can listen to the footage with it just as it comes out and then with the vocal enhancement and then background noise reduction. So if we do a steady 60 miles an hour now and you can listen to the footage with it just as it comes out and then with the vocal enhancement and then background noise reduction. So if we do a steady 60 miles an hour now and you can listen to the footage with it just as it comes out and then with the vocal enhancement and then background noise reduction. Now downsides. So these are the things that bug me about it. And I'm gonna run through your list. 
So first of all, getting into those settings, the reason that footage was bleached out, it was a fiddle to get to change the field of view because I wanted wide, I didn't want super wide or linear. You know, I wanted to find the setting I wanted using the 4K mod and then I accidentally pressed manual mode and I didn't realize, I should have checked the back of the screen. And when I, when I saw the footage back, I was like, oh, what have I done? When I looked at it, it was really obvious what I'd done. I hadn't checked the screen, but on a GoPro, it's a lot easier to find the settings you need and those deeper settings, you have to turn ProTune on and go in and be more deliberate about it. You still have to remember to turn them off again. But it's good there's a manual mode, but it's annoying I lost that bit of footage. It wasn't a bit of footage, it was essential, but that could have been. That could have been something that really mattered and I only had one chance. So yeah, I'd like to see that sorted out. It's not totally GoPro mount friendly. Now it does fit GoPro mounts uh, and it's fine. I've used it all with GoPro mounts, but it's a little bit tight. It's actually really hard to get them in. And while I was shooting some comparison footage earlier, uh, I took it off to turn it around when I was trying the mic front and back and lost the securing nut. And disappeared in the road or in, into the nooks and crannies of the engine somewhere. And it's so tight, I was able to run it just by putting the, the bolt through and it all held itself together. But it's really stiff and real jiggle to get in. It's not the end of the world. Um, but it's a, it's a little gripe. That is a gripe, but a big gripe for me is the fact that the buttons are really hard to press with gloves on. Once it's in the cage, when it's out of the cage, they're fine. But with it in the cage, it's really hard to get your fingers in with gloves on to press these buttons. And they're, uh, you need to press them quite hard to get them to uh, activate. Now, if the camera's out in front of me when I'm riding, I often just can't do it. I have to actually make a point of stopping. Sometimes you have to depend on the gloves I'm wearing, take the gloves off to press it. That needs sorting out and that's not gonna be a firmware fix. I think um, maybe it needs a cage redesign, I'm not sure, but something needs doing, I think, to, to make that right. So it's more something you need to be aware of, but stitch lines close up. When you get to a goodly distance, probably a good arm's length, uh, if the lens is looking straight at you, uh, obviously you're not gonna have any problems with stitch lines, but the stitch lines from the sides and the top and the bottom, they can be an issue. So with the, uh, the thing is, it does actually do a really good job, but you can notice in some footage, like when I've got the camera mounted on top of the, just stuck to the headlight of some bikes, you see the indicators keep disappearing and reappearing. It is doing a good job of, of stitching it together. And certainly with the update, the difference between light and dark, uh, if you're riding into the sun, the difference in the sky is, is sorted out a lot better. So it's good. It's just, you kind of need to know about the stitch lines. Really, as far as I'm aware, the Insta360 ONE X, which is slightly slimmer, was a little bit better at this but this wouldn't stop me buying it. It didn't stop me buying it. There's no one touch recording yet. So with a GoPro, just hit the button and it will power up, start recording, hit the button again and it will stop recording and power down. Brilliant, really good when you're riding, especially if I'm out on a launch where you need to just set the camera up and then be riding nonstop. You can't be stopping to get footage because you're riding in a group and you're riding pretty fast. You really need to be able to have easy access to, to those buttons. And on this, you can't just hit the button. It does start up a lot quicker than it used to since the update, so that's really good. It's just not quite as easy to use when you're riding. There is a remote control available for it though, so I haven't used that. It'd be interesting to see what that's like, but you can get a remote control that can power it up and control it. So that is a, a good thing that it can do. It's just a little bit frustrating that you need to buy some extra. But then again, if it's on the end of a selfie stick sticking out the back of your bike, you're not going to be able to reach it anyway, so yeah, fair enough. Now filming something like this, I'm using my GoPro 7 over there as camera two. It gives me something to kind of splice in between for the inevitable multiple times I cock this up. Uh, but it's handy having it. Now that will shoot 15 minutes and then start another 15 minutes. So all I do is lay down this audio track in Premiere Pro or Final Cut, I use Premiere Pro. And then I sync the first one and then stack the other ones behind it. And there's milliseconds of gap between them. I, I can't see it, it doesn't go out of sync. Certainly on an hour long video, I've not had any problems with it. This will shoot 30 minutes at a time and then another 30 minutes. The problem is it leaves one minute and 10 seconds between each clip. It just means I can't use this as camera two, which is a shame. Now the camera did seem to suffer from crashes before the update. I haven't had any since, touch wood. Uh, but the desktop app does tend to crash. Uh, it seemed to be more with really complicated footage where there's a lot of transitions. Uh, and they're quite long and then when it hasn't done it when I'm just editing one but then when I leave that exporting in the background and then go to edit another that's where it's fallen over now earlier on I was doing the audio tests and there was no transitions and there were three minute clips and I was exporting six at a time it's fine I think if you're working really complicated on it it just kind of falls over so I tend to when I'm doing the big jobs I tend to edit one export it 
do something else or in another application, do some writing while I'm waiting for that to export. And it doesn't take too long, um, but yeah, don't upset it. Another thing with editing on the desktop is of course that I've got a mid-2015 MacBook Pro with 16 gig of RAM. It's not really powerful enough for good smooth editing of it. Uh, it's a little bit choppy. I run it with nothing else run, nothing else going on in the background much and it's okay, it's acceptable, but it does take a bit of a while to edit through stuff because it gets a little bit choppy, but it's not bad, it, it's, it's doable. You can of course use the mobile phone app, but it's all right. Uh, and it's good for doing that thing where you, you kind of move the camera around to see the view, but I just, I, I find that's good for social media quick posts, but for doing stuff where I'm doing proper footage where I need it for, for a proper video, it's just, maybe it's my fat thumbs, but I just don't find it that accurate, so I prefer to work on a desktop app. And you can, of course, edit direct into Premiere Pro, but I find that it's just bogs down. And maybe with a fast computer, that'd be better, but I prefer to edit in Insta360's desktop app on the Mac, uh, and then export it and it does add another stage but once it's done then I can edit that footage into Premiere Pro and it speeds up my process a lot quicker. That desktop app is good but there's one massive glaring pain in the ass for me and it's that it won't focus on where the playhead is in the timeline and if you've used any most video editing software if you've got a long uh, timeline that goes out of view and the, the uh, playhead is moving through it, you can set the app to follow the playhead, so the timeline moves behind the playhead, if, playhead effectively. The reason that's an issue on the Insta360 is that if you're using multiple transitions, especially ones close together, uh, multiple viewpoints, the transitions between them, you can change those. So rather than being move, move, and very robotic, you can do ones that ramp in and out really easily. Just click on the transition line, and it'll, it'll speed up and slow down, just like you're panning a real camera. And it makes a massive difference. But when I'm doing a footage that's got 30, 40 viewpoints, so 30, 40 transitions over quite a long clip, I have to zoom right in. And as soon as you zoom in, it loses the playhead. And it's really irritating. It's really hard to find where it was. And then as you're watching it, it just keeps going out of frame. So please, please, Insta360, please update that and make it track the playhead. It will transform how I work. Do it just for me, please. Also, I think you kind of get used to this, but some of the buttons in that desktop app on the Mac at the moment, uh, the up down buttons for changing the pitch and roll and stuff like that, they're not, you don't click where the buttons are. You have to kind of click to the side to find them. That's a bit annoying. You can type the numbers in that you want, but it's a, it's a bit frustrating. Uh, I'm sure that can be fixed, but if you're gonna fix anything, fix that, fix that. Timeline, please. Also, and uh, I'm not sure how you could fix this. It'd be nice if, you, if the timeline could show small previews of the footage of what's happening. But I'll sometimes use the Insta360. It's very handy for if I want to get panning shots. And you know, again, I'm shooting on my own. It's about saving money to a certain extent as well, but I'm shooting on my own. So I put the camera at the side of the road and then ride past it. And then in, in, in the edit, I'll set the camera up to be looking and then pan as I come past, which is brilliant. But it means that you've got to put the camera down, ride off, turn around, wait for the cars, ride past, turn around, wait for the cars, ride past. So you can have five or 10 minute, a good five minute video clip, and you only need three or four seconds from it. You're only going past three, four seconds. Finding that clip can be really frustrating. So it'd be nice if there was a way of maybe skimming through the footage to find what you wanted just that bit easier, because at the moment it's just, um, a bit frustrating trying to find that, but I can deal with it. So a lot of these things really can be cured with updates. Uh, I think the button press is the main one that can't. Um, you know, I can work around it, but it does stop me. It makes me think twice before I use this on something where I'm not going to be able to stop. Where For most stuff where I can stop, it's not an issue. But everything else, Insta360 has proved they will fix things with updates. It's gone from being a camera that there are a few caveat, quite a few caveats, quite a few provisos of why I'd say, you know, it's very good, but now it's very good, but you do need to know the things that, you know, if you're not interested in 360 footage, then you're probably not watching this video. If you are still here, uh, but you're not interested in 360 footage, then I'd say go and buy a GoPro Hero 7. Um, don't buy the 8 personally, because it's not got a removable lens cover and I've already ruined one with um, spatter from an angle grinder and I was able to just take it off and replace it. 
So get a GoPro 7 or wait and see what comes out later in the year. But if you are interested in the 360 footage, then this, there are faults. And you know, I urge you to watch this video through, not if you've just skipped to the end, watch it through. I'm not trying to make you watch it all. There are things you need to know and only you can decide if they matter to you. Personally, I can't stress enough how this has transformed how I work. It was worth buying after it got broken, um, not by me. You know, I very nearly broke it when I rode it into a fence post and, and luckily it hit this and bent it and hit the selfie stick, so I bought a new selfie stick. But it really is worth it. It's not hard to justify for what I do. And yeah, I really would recommend it. Let me know in the comments below if you're thinking about changing over from a single lens camera to something like this, or have you used one? What's been your experience? Are you converted to 360? Do you think it's worth the extra footage? I know, you know there, are, there are a fair few you know, very good vloggers out there who don't really want to use it just yet, and they've got you know, good reason to, but personally, this has made a massive difference to how I work, and yeah, it's good. So you're gonna to have to excuse the state of the garage at the moment. Um, I've been building a new shed for the last few weeks uh, and that's taken up my weekends and evenings. But I will be doing a video very soon on how to make your shed secure, so check back again for that. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to set this up to be a, it's a workshop, um, but I need it to be a filming studio as well, so I don't have to keep faffing about, but it's just got in a right old mess. Uh, but because I had to move everything from one place to another, to another, to another. And now finally I'm trying to empty this one out just to get a bit more room in it so I can turn it into a better workshop. It's amazing how much crap you can build up in a garage, isn't it? When, you're, you, know, when you don't realize how much you're using.